Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 13th episode of Disability Discrimination Band Starting Now. Disability Discrimination Band Starting Now has been around for five months now, and um, I have really, really enjoyed doing this so y'all can learn about the the world that I live in and all the other guests I have on and today I am having my third beacon professor that I had on now this this woman Dr. Nance uh pushed pushed me in a good way was not was not an easy person uh Sorry, give me a sec. Um, was the type of person that did not take any nonsense and pushed us to our biggest potential. Uh, Dr. Nance, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So I have I have said you were a beacon professor. But can you tell my audience a little bit more about you? Um, yeah, I was a mental health counselor for 50 years. Um, I retired my license a couple of years ago. Um, and I've taught for more than 30 years. Uh, and um, I was teaching a graduate counseling class. And one of my former students there um, told me about Beacon College and she said you should come and teach and I said well, I'm not really looking for a job and she said well they just want somebody for summer um, so I went in and taught a summer class and I just liked it and stayed so it's been 13 years now. Well I'm glad I'm glad you you have stayed because you um, you were one of my all-time favorite professors that I've had. And and we I've had the same for all four years. But although in some of the classes, and we're gonna get into this, the material was hard, it was very interesting to learn about and made me work even harder on the assignments because this these classes were so uh, sad to learn about in a certain sense, but uh, very interesting that I had never heard about most of the stuff that you covered. So um, now that I know you had been at Beacon for 13 years, what is your favorite thing about being a professor that's kept you there? No two days are the same, um, and there are always new things to learn. Um, so I like that. Uh, probably um, it's, it's um, challenging. You know, it's it's a challenging thing. I get bored pretty easily, so uh, this is a place I don't get bored. <laughs> well, I I also um, I get bored easily, but I never got bored when I was. Uh, when I was in college. So as as you did mention, you were a mental health counselor for 50 years, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there, as I mentioned right right now, there were some classes that had heavy material that were hard for some students to learn about, like the eating disorders, like the mental health disorders. How did you uh, go about creating the lessons for the students to understand, but isn't triggered by one thing that you're talking, that you're showing us? Yeah, there's no guarantee that people won't be triggered. Um, and in fact, I, uh, even in my syllabus, uh, I have a, a statement about how to handle triggers. Uh, if you're in a psychology class or human services class, and most people that were in those classes were in the program, there's a pretty good chance you're going to work someplace where you get triggered. So it wasn't a matter of trying to avoid triggers, but uh, to try to help people to um, recognize what's triggering and recognize what they need to do when they get triggered. 
Yeah. Um, so I know at first you had said that you weren't interested in being a professor when a student first told you about Beacon. But as you were teaching that summer course, what got you to like, okay, I want to be a professor at Beacon? Yeah, um, I had worked with mostly, um, I want to say, uh, older learners, because in graduate school, people are already working. Um, and I had taught also in community colleges, so I had worked with younger undergraduates as well. <clears throat> the first uh, class at Beacon was a general psychology class. And this, it was uh, a big class, a big summer class. So there probably were 20 students in it. Um, and they were all different. Uh, everybody had, and they were very supportive of each other and happy to, to show me what I didn't know. Because I told them, I, I'm here, you know, I'm a psychology teacher. I'm not coming in here as a, any kind of a specialist in neurodiversity. So you have to tell me what you need. Um, and they were good about doing that. And I, I, I saw how resourceful people were. One time the electricity went out in the middle of a test and everybody just lit up their phones and kept taking the test. And, All right, I can, I can work with this. There's no fuss, no fuss. And you can see there are people you, that you were, were very familiar with having to meet challenges. Um, so, uh, and uh, some of the students were very forthcoming. So I had some good talkers in the class. They kind of represented the class for me. So I thought I just got interested. Yeah, you're a good talker. <laughs> and one thing I remember too is that with any of your classes, you did it by grade, but also a point system. And I was always so good about getting my assignments in on time that towards the end of the semester, I would, I would get, you have surpassed the amount of points that you need for the class. And I was like, and it's kudos to you because you make it interesting. It's like the more interesting, the more intriguing the class is, you could say, the more you want to actually do, do the work. Yeah, I owe the anything that's interesting. I owe to the people I saw over the fifty years that I was a mental health counselor, because I think what I get the most feedback about is that it was interesting because a, a lot of the examples were about real people, you know. Um, so I could, you know, kind of um, hook that into real life. The other thing is I always try to want to hook it into real life for the students. You know, what does this mean to you? Um, who do you know that you? you know, may have judged about something and actually this other thing would account better for, for their behaviors. So I always wanted to make that connection. Um, and I like to have fun in class. I say at the beginning of most of my classes, especially if it's new students, I'm having fun whether you are or not. So you decide whether you also want to have fun. Um, <laughs> because you have to have that uh, lighthearted corner of every, no matter how serious the topic is, yeah, um, you can't let that take away your well-being and your sense of humor. So, uh, and then that's how we cope at work too. Again, it's just like the triggers on the job. If you can't laugh at things that are tragic, if you can't find that one funny thing that happens, um, you'll burn out really fast. So then you've got four years of education. If you burn out in two, you really didn't get your bang for your buck. So I want to make sure people have some durability. Yeah. So I've talked to Mark Roberts, uh, Dr. Marsden, and now, of course, you and Mark and Dr. Marsden both said they have learned some things from students as they're teaching. What is the biggest thing that you have learned from a student? I don't know if it's from a particular student, but I would say what I've learned from students a lot is how much they cover what isn't working for them. And if I don't go in and ask what's not working, a lot of students aren't, they're shameful and won't say, I'm not getting this. So um, uh, that was probably, I learned that early on. They're not going to ask, I'm going to have to find it, which is real different from my other students. Um, you know, and I know that people think that people that have any kind of disability are needy, but the fact is the students in the general population, when I taught in community colleges and when I taught at graduate school, they were needier, you know, they were like, oh, I've got, but I've got kids and 
I'm, you know, the dog ate the homework and, you know, but um, in, in Beacon is kind of the opposite. It's like people hiding anything that was a challenge. So we're kind of lifting the shame off, you know, there being challenges and just taking that as that is our norm. Is there going to be challenges? What are yours? So Beacon has gained a lot of uh, attention with uh, being called one of the best schools for uh, students with learning disabilities in the U.S. And of course, we see a lot of international students there now. Why do you think that Beacon has been called the best and we are getting international students? I think um, why it's called the best I honestly, part of the reason I stay in any job it, is I have to I have to like it and like the organization and what it's about. And I th thought even from the maybe not the first term because that was a summer, but when I taught the fall after, it seemed to me that um, administration took care of us so that we could take care of the students. So um, you know, if I called tech and said there's a problem in the classroom, they would drop everything because it's in the classroom, it's for the students and they would get there and do that. It, that's just unheard of in other schools um, to have that kind of um, prioritizing by the staff, the faculty, administration. So if I can get what I need to teach people, um, whether it was clickers, when you know before we had other ways to do polling, whatever I would ask for, that would be for the benefit of the students. So you know, that's, uh, that probably engaged me. Work culture is really important. It's something that I teach about too. You know, because, um, certainly you guys are out in the workforce, and to know where you're not going to fit because you're never, no matter what good job you do, it'll never fit into the culture. The culture here was very much service oriented, and they want to get the job done, and I want to get the job done. So um, it, it very little conflict about anything. In the department I work in. Um, the the professors there like we're really a real tight group we've done other projects together um just find it enjoyable to work together we're not really competitive we're diverse so uh, all of those things you know but for me to stay someplace 13 years you know as a mental health counselor i i hadn't worked for anybody else besides myself for quite a long time and i had some college contracts you know but I could accept or reject them. I taught at many schools as an adjunct, but to take an actual full-time position, um, I had to really trust the organization itself, and I did. I still do. Well, that's uh, that's very good because uh, Beacon is an amazing school, but also the students have one of the who are in human services who will have you will have had one of the best and I know I'm keeping on complimenting you but one of the best professors that uh that's door is always open you you answer emails in 0.5 seconds because <laughs> there was one time I sent one and then within a second later I was already getting a response from you I'm like, leave it to Dr. Nance to respond to emails right away. Now, are well, there... I know sometimes you can... Go ahead. I was going to oh. say, I know sometimes students get stuck and you might need an answer that is only <laughs> going to take me 10 seconds to answer. Why should I keep you waiting for, you know, until Monday when, when I can answer it right now and you can get your work done? It just makes sense to me. It doesn't really deprive me of anything to answer your email. I, don't, I never thought I was so important that I couldn't look at my emails over the weekend. Well, plus the quicker the professors answer the emails, the quicker you'll get the assignment turned in. Right. So it'll help uh, you get starting the grade early. Um, are there any challenges with teaching students with any type of disability? Um, any specific type? Uh, no, the, the, the challenge is blending them. Um, if you have nothing but people with um, attention deficit disorder and take away every other thing and you only have people with attention deficit disorder in the classroom, Half of those 
are distracting the other half and the other half can't do anything because they're distracted. So you have two opposite things that have to be accommodated. And that's the challenge. It's the same with the processing disorders. And we have people, again, you have ADHD people, but they really grab things really fast. A lot of them um, just grab things really fast. And they feel like they're sitting around waiting for somebody else to get the instructions. Um, and I don't, you know, my job is to make sure that some people can get started. And then if I need to go over instructions with others, I can. So if you blend all of the different things going on with people, you know, like with, and within those classes, I'm also going to have people that have hearing problems that have visual problems that have ambulation problems, you know, so to get that all kind of working together, I, sometimes I feel like I'm in the inside of an old pinball machine and I'm the ball, you know, <laughs> like it's like having to attend to all these things but that again that's what keeps it interesting for me that's what keeps me there if we, if at any point in time I go in and everybody gets everything right away I think well it wasn't hard enough you know <laughs> so but <laughs> let me make it harder for myself yeah. um so of course these next few I always ask with every interview that I do because I find that they are important to hear from multiple people but what do you think the world can learn from a student at Beacon? Everybody has their own story and that no two people are alike and that a diagnosis isn't an identification it's a classification so you know you can't see on an application form you know I have you know this is, uh, you know, something I need accommodated and will think that you know a thing because you don't know what that means to that person unless you know the person. The person is the person, no matter what the, um, you know, the learning challenge is. So I think people really need to know that if they're, do if they're hiring, they need to know that most accommodations cost companies less than 500 bucks and some of them cost nothing. You know, that, those are the things that, that people need to know that, um, that if you put any person with or without a learning difference in a position, some of them are going to do better in some positions than others because of what their um, what their preferences are and you know and what their interests are. So a lot of things aren't specific, but you know if you separate that out and say, well, they need this, this, and this because if you think you know somebody before you get to know them, then that's a problem. Yeah, don't judge a book by its cover. Um, so as I was researching starting this podcast in January, I had noticed there was little to no episodes or podcasts in general tackling the discrimination against uh, people with limitations or disabilities. Why do you think there's a lack of conversation about it? I think the lack of conversation is on both sides. The, you know, the same thing that keeps students from telling me what they need or saying that they aren't getting it is part is half of it. The other half of it is that people who do hiring um, or you know uh, make a, make assignments for employees that they haven't gotten all the information that they need, so they're going on a on a stereotype. Um, and also that, um, you know, employers in general don't want anything that's going to cost that's going to hurt their bottom line. So if they think somebody's not going to be productive, then, um, you know, that might be just their fantasy, but it'd be the thing that keeps them from hiring. And it, you know, and it is discrimination, um, you know, based on stereotyping. So it's, you know, and it, it's, to me, it's a, a it, it's a real problem because of how many would a large part of the population has some kind of disability. 40 million Americans I read live with a disability. And um, so what would you say to someone that does not view or understands as a, a person with a disability is equal to them? I guess it would depend on the context. You know, if this was somebody who said to me, we had a, you know, three applicants for our job, but one of them had this disability, um, 
I, I, and they were eliminated. Like they looked better on paper than the other two, but I was concerned about the disability. Then I'm going to do whatever I would do with anything else like that. Is so like, what, what was your concern exactly? And what was that based on? Um, I, and, um, and then if there's something to challenge in that, you know, talk to them about like, you know, certainly there's enough information about successful people being successful on the job. Um, and the other thing that I would tell them is you're already, you already have employed people with disabilities. They haven't told you and you haven't noticed. <laughs> because just like in the classroom, you know, in community college, well, I've already taught people with learning issues because they haven't told me and I haven't noticed because it hasn't interfered with their performance at all. You know, they've already made their own accommodations. Yeah, and this is one of my favorite uh, questions to ask everyone. What would you say to your younger self? With you having the career that you have had now? Be true to yourself. I don't be know that I would do anything. Yeah, be true to yourself. I don't know that I would do anything different. I, I you know, my career wasn't, I worked for myself for a reason. Because <laughs> uh, I wanted things done a certain way. And, um, and anytime I worked for somebody else, I was like a workhorse. I mean, you know, nobody like fired me or wanted me to go, but that didn't mean I liked the system that I was working in. Um, so I would just do something about that. But when I was, I guess I'll tell you this, when I first started out, I was, um, yeah, this was a, a time that was very liberal. Everybody was in, you know, jeans and t-shirts and people just getting out of college. There were so many baby boomers getting out. It was very casual. And I worked in substance abuse, which was very casual. Um, and somebody said to me, you know, like, you're so smart. Um, oh, it was, this was a board member that I was doing a presentation. You're so smart. You should like dress better and, you know, clean up your language. And I thought, then that would be somebody else. That wouldn't be me. You know, in my mind, I thought, no, whoever can accept me this way, the way I am, that's who gets me, you know, because I knew I had a lot to give. Um, and so I didn't change anything. And, you know, was it a hassle sometimes? Well, yeah. Um, and, um, but I didn't care because to me, any hassle I did at that time was making it better for somebody ahead of me. You know, so if there was discrimination for being a woman, if there was sexual harassment, I took all that on. I had no problem, uh, you know, uh, going to um, equal opportunity. Or, you know, I mean, I used the systems that were in place. Uh, and I, have, you know, I think I would just say, be true to yourself. And if I was true to myself, I was happy. And if I wasn't true to myself, or if I thought I couldn't work someplace and still be me, I left. Um, so I guess I'd say, you know, maybe I would say, do it as abrasively as as you do when you're in your 20s and I think I've gotten a lot slicker <laughs> over the 50 years and deliver that message but the message is still the same you know if you want the goods then you get the rest of this you know and if you if you're discriminating against that then I, then I'm probably working in a place where you're discriminating against other people yeah, and I I like how you don't take any nonsense from anyone. Like I learned that in in college, but also with you saying if I face any of these issues, I take them head on. And I don't I don't pick you back the easy way out of that situation. It only makes things worse. When things are ignored, they only get bigger and worse. And, you know, I think a lot of that is, you know, uh, it's like part of my upbringing. My father was a union guy and um, taking things on was, you know, he was very good at it. Uh, you know, and he was a hard worker. Nobody wanted to lose him. So they, so they tried to please him. And I, I think, you know, I learned what, do, if you do a good job, if you bring something extra to the job, um, then when you have something to say, they don't want to lose you, then maybe they'll listen. So, um, you know, sometimes my way of taking it head on was you know, nobody's indispensable, but I think it's inconvenient to lose a good employee. Um, you know, so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of politicking you know, that goes on. And again, I got smoother over the years, but uh, I don't know that I have any regrets. I don't think I do. <laughs> I've been pretty successful and live my life the way I want to, both. So I'm good. 
I um uh, I wouldn't think you would have any regrets because you're you're an amazing woman you're an amazing professor and I can't tell you how lucky I am or all the students in the human services psychology program are in now how we scored big having you as our professor and Thank that you. and <laughs> you're too kind to me <laughs> Well, it's it's true. I like professors that make things fun. And there were times where I knew we were learning a serious topic, but you kind of, in a way for me, created it in a way to where I could handle, handle it. And uh, not, of course, I wouldn't, I would hope no students get triggered by what what we learned, but how you did it really helped me sit through saying, okay, this is what this is. This is what has to happen in order for it to get better or to or to be manageable. And good for you for being a counselor for 50 years. I'm I'm very very impressed with you Dr. Nance. But thank thank you for coming on the podcast. I'm pretty sure everyone will enjoy hearing or will have enjoyed hearing what you had to say because I want to bring on a lot of the professors that I have had. So so not only they can hear from you from you guys but then my uh some people that I talk to you guys about will understand why I talk so highly about beacon and about the professors cuz all of you are amazing I always feel I'm in the best company there yes yes you are and so have a thank you everyone for listening to the 13th episode of the podcast and i will talk to you next week bye guys